Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's uh, really great to be here. Um, nice to see so many people as well. Um, so just to give everyone a little bit of a, uh, a background on me. Um, so I, I actually started my, my cyanobacteria journey uh, way back in my undergrad degree. Um, I did a little bit of uh, unpublished work with Dave Adams at the University of Leeds where I was working on uh, hormogonia form formation in Anabina. Um, but I, I kind of, I guess I sort of hit my stride during my masters at Southampton where I was working on iron stress proteomics and trichodesmine. Um, then I went on to the University of Bristol, for my PhD with uh, Patricia Sanchez Barricaldo. That was on the diversity and genomics of polar cyanobacteria. And after a little mini postdoc there, I, I then joined Michael Cunliffe's group at the MBA in Plymouth. Um, and that's where I've been for the past four years, three or four years, um, involved with several projects, but mainly revolving around uh, marine fungi. Um, but for this talk, uh, unsurprisingly, I'm going to be focusing on uh, this bit here, uh, my PhD work, and kind of give a bit of a, a retrospective on all of the stuff that I did. So most of you probably don't need the cyanobacteria primer, but in case you do, um, they are really ancient lineage of prokaryotes. Um, the exact date that they originated is a bit under dispute, but suffice to say, it was a long time ago, somewhere around two and a half billion years ago. And they were the first organisms to evolve oxygenic photosynthesis, right? And as such, they're thought to have played a, like, a really big part in, in the initial oxygenation of the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, yeah, many lineages of cyanobacteria are also capable of fixing atmospheric nitrogen, transforming it into biologically labile forms. They're, they're key players in the global nitrogen cycle, particularly in marine and other environments where, where nitrogen is limiting. And their age, their age also means that they survived through huge amounts of environmental change. Um, and importantly for this talk, this, this includes a widespread global glaciations that occurred during the Neoproterozoic, commonly referred to as Snowball Earth. So cyanobacteria have a real legacy of being able to survive in the cold. Um, and even now, they're really important in the contemporary cryosphere. They can be found in, in terrestrial cold places all across the globe, including the Arctic, Antarctic, Alpine regions. And, uh, and within these broad geographical locations, they actually occupy a, a real variety of different habitats. Right? So these, these sort of dark holes here, these are uh, on the surface of a glacier, and these are called cryokonite holes. Um, and they're filled with, with dust, and they're, they're chock full of filamentous cyanobacteria. Um, this picture here, you can't quite see it, but these kind of big blobs that you see, um, they're not rocks, they are like golf ball sized colonies of Nostok uh, in a lake in Greenland. Up here we've got a, like, this green layer, that's an endolithic cyanobacteria from a, sort of inside a, a quartz rock from a cold desert in Utah. And so in all of, in all of these, these sort of polar habitats and like cold habitats, cyanobacteria are really important primary producers. Um, where they, where the, they're dominating over vascular plants, really. But despite their dominant dominance, these environments, there's still a lot we don't know about their diversity, when they evolved, and how they're adapted to surviving in extreme cold environments. So for my PhD, I kind of wanted to begin to try and answer some of these questions. I broke it down into a few, a few primary aims. First of all, I wanted to survey the available sequence data on cyanobacteria from the cryosphere to find out exactly, exactly how much information was already out there in terms of diversity. And then I wanted to use this data to make, uh, to make predictions as to whether any of the lineages of cyanobacteria that we were looking at were actually specific to living in cold environments. And uh, I sequenced two genomes of cyanobacteria, one from the Arctic, and one from the Antarctic to try and find out if they showed any of the genomic signatures of psychrophily, so a, a, a preference for living and growing in cold temperatures. And finally, I wanted to look at these genomes for 
for other adaptations that might allow them to survive in extreme environments of the polar and alpine regions that aren't necessarily related to um, surviving in the cold. So by surveying all the available 16S ribosomal RNA sequences for cyanobacteria that, that have been deposited in NCBI GenBAC, we, we recovered like sequences from all across the cryosphere, right? So from, you know, in the Arctic, they were coming from Svalbard, Greenland, Alaska, Canada, um, and high altitude regions. We had se sequences from Himalaya and the Tibetan Plateau and in the Alps. Um, Antarctica, unsurprisingly, has been really well sampled in terms of cyanobacteria with a big focus of studies in McMurdo Dry Valleys. But there's, there's still definitely gaps in sampling locations there. There's a notable absence from Russia um, and not many sequences from South America. Um, and even now, however many years on, so this would sort of been sampled like six, seven years ago um, that we were doing this search. Um, and even now, you know, this is still patchy, um, but I know that there is more research being focused in some of these underrepresented regions. So um, you know, this, is a, this is a map that can probably be updated now. So that's where the sequences are from. And the next, the next big question is, you know, what are they? So we placed, we placed all of these sequences within, a, within the context of cyanobacteria from all across the, the cyanobacterial phylum and generated this big phylogeny. And as a bit of an aside, there, there, there are some issues with using the 16S gene for phylogenetics of cyanobacteria when you're trying to recover really deep branching clades. Um, so to get around this, this issue of just using the 16S data set, we actually used a big sampling of existing genomes and built a constraint tree built from 135 proteins and RNA genes to enforce the structure of the deep branches. Um, that would otherwise have been really poorly resolved. Um, and so by doing that, we get, actually get this quite sort of nice, nice representation of where everything is in the tree. And while it's a bit difficult to read at this scale, what, what I hope you can gather from it is that there's a massive amount of diversity there, right? All of these major groups of cyanobacteria have members in the cryosphere. Uh, some contain line lineages that are cosmopolitan, so they're found in loads of different environments. And some are only found in cold places, so being restricted to a single geographical location like Antarctica. So uh, once we found out what was there, we then sort of wanted to move on and started to try and answer some more in-depth questions about cold adaptation. Um, so using, using this technique called ancestral state reconstruction, a piece of software called Bayes Traits, we can make predictions about which cyanobacterial lineages were likely to have a cold tolerant ancestor based upon information about what cyanobacteria were present there. Um, so if a clade is particularly dominated by things from cold environments, then it's much more likely that that clade will have originated there. Whereas if there are, that clade is full of kind of a mix and match of um, lineages, from different environments, then the, then the probability of that having a cold tolerant ancestor actually goes down. Um, so in this way, we, we, we came up with 20 different lineages, um, which were all kind of distributed throughout the, throughout the tree um, that are likely to have had a cold tolerant ancestor. And in some cyanobacteria, there appear to be several independent events where populations have been established in the cryosphere. So Sudanabina, for example, there are four different clades within Sudanabina, which all kind of have a cold tolerant ancestor. The entire clade as a whole doesn't, but there appear to be like several different independent incursions into cold environments. Right? But interestingly, not all of the cyanobacteria that really dominate in cold environments seem to belong to lineages that actually originated there. So this, this clade of Leptolimbaya here right, is commonly found in Antarctica. Right? All of these orange blobs here, they're examples of Antarctic sequences. But there's no more likelihood of it actually having originated there as it is to have done in any other environment. Uh, so it's a real mixture of stories about how these things have evolved. Um, it's not one event the kind of adapt adaptation to the cold in cyanobacteria has like, occurred multiple times. Right? So now we know that there are many, many cyanobacteria 
with a putative cold tolerant ancestor, one of the big outstanding questions is, are they truly adapted to surviving in cold environments? Are they psychrophilic? Do they, do they actually prefer living in the cold than the warm? It's generally assumed that they're not, since the vast majority of cyanobacteria from the cryosphere that have been cultured to date actually grow better at much higher temperatures than ambient temperatures in the natural environment. And while, while the ambient growth like, temperature during the growth season is, is often close to freezing, cyanobacteria like, from the cryosphere have regularly been shown to grow much faster, sort of 15, 25 degrees. And you can see from these, you know, you can see this here in some of these growth experiments that we did on Antarctic Leptolin Bio, that, you know, we've got really slow growth here for 10 degrees. And then as soon as you turn the temperature up, they really start dividing much, much more rapidly. Right? They don't prefer being in the cold to being in the warm. They seem to prefer being in the warm. But you kind of do notice here um, that there is actually a drop off in biomass right, after being grown at these higher temperatures right, for a long period of time. So they're not able to sustain it. They, are, they might be blowing out their resources, but they seem to be more stable at cold temperatures. They're not growing fast, but they are kind of quite comfortable ticking over at these cold temperatures. So the big thing to do next was, was do some genome sequencing and have a look at genomic adaptation to, to the cold. Um, so we sequenced two genomes, for Modesmus BC1401, which was from cryoconite in Greenland. And this is a member of one of those predicted cold tolerant clades that I mentioned earlier. And the second, Leptolin Bio BC1307, which was from, uh, from Antarctica. And this was one of those, those sort of not necessarily a truly cold tolerant clay, right? Before I go on to that, I just wanted to mention something briefly about the genome assemblies. I was working with, uh, with non-axenic cultures. So these were cultures that had been taken from an environmental sample, single filaments isolated out and then grown up in bulk, um, but they weren't axenic. So they still had all of these other, other common cell organisms attached to them. And so, my first assemblies were like a simple metagenome, dominated by a single cyanobacterium, but with all of these other things in there as well. And you can, you can visualize your assemblies using a piece of software called Bandage. Um, this is an example of the BC1401 assembly. Um, and you can see that I've highlighted all of the contigs with a read depth of greater than 10 in orange. And all of these labels are all blast hits for core cyanobacterial genes. And so you can see that the cyanobacterial assembly, part of the assembly, is actually really discreet from the rest of it. And you see, that it was actually fairly straightforward to separate out the cyanobacterial component of the metagenome and discard everything else and then reassemble just from the cyanobacterial reads to generate your final draft genome. Since I did this work, metagenome binning has come on like loads and loads. Software to do it is really much better than it was back then. Um, and so it'd be really great to see more genomes like this becoming available, expanding out using new software and stuff. But yeah, once we generated those genomes, um, several ways that we could look for genomic adaptation within them. First of all, I wanted to look at the genes responsible for cold shock. So are they the same genes in cold strains as in temperate relatives? Are they there in the same numbers? And second, we can look at the uh, look at the use of certain amino acids within the genome, which are biased in organisms adapted to the cold, particularly in terms of the ratios of arginine to lysine and the overall proline content. In both of these genomes, we found no clear evidence for like, the genome-wide adaptation to the cold. The numbers of cold stress genes in the arginine and proline content were pretty much the same as in genomes of cyanobacteria from warm places as well. And you can see in this table here, which is the, the inventory of the cold shock genes in former Desmus, there's a little bit of variation in copy number, but there are no real patterns to, to be seen. And you can see that the total number of genes is you know, really well conserved across all of these related cyanobacteria. So this kind of, this kind of presents us with a, with a bit of a conundrum. If these organisms are not specifically adapted to the cold, then how are they doing so well there? They must be having other ways of protecting themselves, other ways 
of surviving well in these extreme environments. One, one likely way is this formation of this, this sugary glue stuff that certain cyanobacteria coat themselves with, what's called this extracellular polysaccharide or EPS. And this has, this has a really useful function of reducing the freezing point directly surrounding the cyanobacteria and protecting the cells themselves from actually freezing and rupturing during cold periods. Formidesmus BC1401 is one of these organisms that produces EPS and it forms these really thick sheaths uh, of polysaccharide in the environment. Doesn't do it so well in the lab we found, um, but in the environment, these really, really thick, like gloopy outer coats. And sure enough, when we looked inside the genome, we found it was like really replete with EPS producing mechanisms. Um, so there, are two, there were two major types in there, and there were multiple occurrences of these mechanisms within the genome. This is a visualization of the um, BC1401 genome, and each slice you know, going through here um, is the location of a different EPS-related gene or gene cluster. Those uh, EPS net pathways in a bit more detail. So in the first of these, um, the WZY-dependent pathway, um, the lipid linked sort of individual oligosaccharide units are translocated from the cytoplasm right, to the periplasm by this WZX gene where they're joined together and polymerized. And then the assembled polysaccharides are exported with them from the cell via these transmembrane polysaccharide copolymerase. And there are two different types of these clusters in the genome, both of which contained the full complement of genes. One of which also included a gene related to uh, the MER3 gene from Arabidopsis, um, which is involved in creating structure of cellulose matrices. And the genes found here may encode for similar proteins responsible for similar functions that contribute to the structure of the EPS sheath in form of Desmos. The other sort of pathway, this ABC dependent pathway, where polymerization actually occurs inside the cytoplasm and the ABC transporters move uh, the polysaccharides across the cytoplasmic mem membrane before being exported. Um, and again, there are two, two of these different clusters within the genome. And in both of these types of clusters, there are several different biosynthetic and assembly genes that are also present, suggesting that these are relatively self-contained modules for EPS synthesis and export in former Desmos. So the big question is, is this special? And in a word, well, no, not really. When we looked at all the related genes in other cyanobacteria, we found the former Desmos actually had exactly the same amount of kind of in EPS and membrane related genes as would be expected for any cyanobacteria of that genome size. So what, what might set it apart is actually how this EPS production is regulated. Um, and we don't know yet how, how those regulatory mechanisms might be working, um, but this is likely to be a really, really interesting avenue of further study. Interesting, BC1401, it's the dominant cyanobacterium in many Arctic cryokonite communities. And uh, EPS production has, a, has an ecological role as, a, as well as a biological function. It's quite fundamental for sticking these cryokonite granules together and helping to form this own sort of this little micro habitat. Um, and the way this interaction is mediated, it's not, it's not yet known, um, but interestingly, former Desmos does have this, this WSP system, which is involved in regulating surface adhesion and biofilm form formation. Could this be the answer of how they're sticking the cryokonite together? Again, further, you know, more experimental stuff is necessary for this, but it's it's clear that understanding the way that this EPS production is regulated is essential to understanding how this cryokonite forms. And it's a really, really cool example, I think, of how we can directly link evolutionary adaptation to the physical characteristics of, uh, of some big, large scale environments like ice sheet surfaces. So moving away from the Arctic cryokonite and south to Antarctica, uh, what about this? this Leptolin by a BC1307, which is this lineage without a cold tolerant ancestor. This shows another really interesting way in which adaptation to the polar environment might occur that's actually unrelated to the cold completely. And when we look at the phylogeny, Leptolin by at the moment, it, it's a bit paraphyletic with some things being called Leptolin by coming out as sister, 
to the picocyanobacteria in this group one, um, and others actually grouping with former Desmis um, in group two. But we're interested in this main group, group one, which is where our strain sits. And by searching through um, existing clone library data sets, we were able to show that this, this group um, is actually only found in surface environments in Antarctica, like this red group here. Um, it's not seen under the ice uh, in any of the big lakes, just finding it kind of in, in variety of surface environments. And in these environments, they like to be exposed to a really high amount of light during the austral summer. Highlights good for photosynthesis, but this isn't quite right, right? Because it can actually be a real problem for cyanobacteria as too much light overloads the photosynthetic apparatus. It causes this effect called photoinhibition, um, which reduces the overall efficiency of photosynthesis. And we can see this in the photophysiology of 1307. Um, so the FE over FM, which is the, the photosynthetic efficiency of the organism, and the relative electron transport rate rates are both significantly reduced in high light environments, right? So what is the organism doing to mitigate this? Comparing the genes for the light harvesting apparatus in 1307 to relatives from marine environments, you can see there's actually a big reduction in the number of genes. Both these marine lineages have the antenna pigments phycocyanin in blue and phycoerythrin in red, which allows them to absorb a really broad variety of wavelengths of light from the red through to the blue end of the spectrum. The VC1307, on the other hand, um, appears to have lost most of these phycoerythrin genes. So it's only got phycocyanin. So it's restricting it to using wavelengths of light at the red end of the spectrum, like lower energy light. And while, while photo inhibition is obviously occurring under high light conditions, the loss of genes here, could, it could well be an adaptation to lessen the effects by restricting the wavelengths that are absorbed to lower energy red light. Another way to mitigate the effects of photo inhibition is to channel excess energy into other pathways. Um, typically, this is through the production of carotenoids, um, which in, themselves can act as a sort of sunscreen. And as you can see from this table here, the BC1307 genome is really chock full of carotenoid biosynthetic genes. And this again is mirrored in the photophysiology. So when you expose it to high light, it really ramps up the production of canthexanthin and zeaxanthin. So it, what it's doing is like taking all of that excess light energy and then shoving it into producing these carotenoids, right? So that prevents our photosynthetic apparatus from overloading, so it can continue growing uh, even when it's stressed by having too much light. What does this mean for survival in the Arctic? Well, like being in the cold, BC1307, it doesn't really like living in high light, but it can tolerate it. So it's probably not doing its best during the middle of the austral summer because it's really being overloaded and it's just trying to hang on by using all of these different mechanisms to just keep it going in sort of less than perfect environmental condition. But what we think might be happening is that it might actually have a bimodal growth pattern. So at the beginning and the end of the austral summer, um, when light levels are lower, it might actually do a lot better. So it has this kind of peak of the activity both at the beginning and the end of the season. That's kind of the main bulk of it. We show that there's this really high diversity of cyanobacteria from the cryosphere with at least 20 examples of lineages that may have originated in cold environments, as well as many more that didn't. Cyanobacteria from the cryosphere, they're not particularly cold adapted and don't really display any of the known hallmarks of cyclophilic. But there may be mechanisms out there that we don't quite know about yet. Definitely understanding like, how existing mechanisms such as EPS production regulated might help to explain how these lineages are surviving in cold environments where others are. And finally, it's, it's wrong to say just cold or not cold adapted. There are a whole host of other factors from polar environments that might be affecting the distribution and adaptation of cyanobacteria. So where, where next? It's been, it's been quite a long time since all this work was actually done. Um, and since then, a number of Antarctic metagenomes, uh, metagenome assembled genomes have been released. We've got the first genome of an Antarctic picocyanobacteria and some, some promising work that's looking at ice binding proteins in Nostock, um, amongst other things.
Um, but we're, we're still really barely scratching the surface of what we can do with, with polar cyanobacterial genomics. And there's, there's, there are loads of exciting avenues to explore. Yeah, if anyone's interested in following up any of the things that you know, we've touched on here, um, let me know, it'd be great to, great to talk about it. Everything that's been published here, uh, we've talked about here has been published open access. It's all free to read and all the, all the papers are there. Um, just quick thanks to Patricia and the rest of her group, Bristol Glaciology Center, especially Alex Anisio and Chris Williamson, who is my photophysiology guru, uh, and Gary Barker, who sanity checked all of my bioinformatics. And also my current group for all of their support. You'll find me all the, the social media channels there. And yeah, thanks very much.